Dancers Group is experimenting with new ways to unify, strengthen, and amplify voices in the Bay Area. We're excited to share a variety of ideas and stories. We're back with Any Conversation with me, Andrea Spearman, and today we have Vanessa Sanchez. Hello. She... <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yes. Welcome, welcome. She is a Chicana native dancer, choreographer, and educator who focuses on community arts and traditional dance forms to emphasize voices and experiences of Latina, Chicana, and indigenous women and youth. Based in San Francisco, she is the 2019 Dance USA Artist Fellow, a recipient of the 2019 New England Foundation for the Arts National Dance Production Grant, and holds a BA from San Francisco State University. Sanchez is the founding artistic director of La Mezcla, a rhythmic ensemble of women of color that explores historical narratives and challenges social injustice through tap dance. Mexican Zapatero and Afro Caribbean rhythms. Her production, Pachiquismo, an all female tap dance and son harico performance about the 1943 Zoot Soup Riots, has received the Isadora Duncan Award for Outstanding Production and will tour through 2022. Welcome, Vanessa. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. We are so excited to have you. And now that was just a peek into your artistic background. You recently appeared on the World Arts West program, Living Traditions. And in that conversation, I heard you say that you grew up around San Jarico and its living, breathing culture. Tell the audience more about that. Well, I grew up in San Jose, California. um, And just a little background on that, I started dancing when I was really young, around four I grew up around Son Jarocho through my family. So my family on my mom's side is from Veracruz, Mexico, where Son Jarocho music, dance, the traditions, the culture um, comes from. So Son Jarocho is, is, like I said, the traditional music and dance um, from Veracruz, Mexico, specifically, you know, the southern region of the state. Um, And so, you know, growing up with my abuelos and tias abuelos coming and visiting from Veracruz, it was always around, but it wasn't explicit. You know, they would they would bring costumes. Um, I know that my my brother was um, he was a folklorico dancer when he was very young, and and did a lot of son jarocho sapateado. So it was something I was always around, um, but wasn't directly taught or introduced to any of the dance or music until much later in life. Um, but in terms of the, the cultural significance, it was something that was just part of the family. Yeah. It's that kind of intrinsic nature of being surrounded by it and then getting that more formalized training later. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, after, you know, spending years of, of training in tap dance and, and other dance forms, um, especially in San Francisco around Afro-Cuban and Afro-Brazilian dance. Um, it was actually when I was in, in Brazil with my my teacher and mentor, Tania Santiago, um, that I realized, you know, I'm, I'm spending so much time learning about this amazing, beautiful culture of Brazil. What about the culture that my family comes from? You know, I, I haven't mm-hmm. I haven't dived nearly as deep into that. And so it was around that time where I realized, all right, I think it's time for me to to – start exploring that side. Um, and so I, I traveled through Mexico and Veracruz by myself one summer and then ended up moving there the following year to just really start learning about the traditions. Um, the the form of Son Jarocho that I, I have studied and, you know, spent a lot of time researching is, is Fandango style. So mm. it's um, not the same as Folklorico. Folklorico is an amazing, rich, beautiful tradition um, but the fandango style is, it's rooted in the campos, in the, the, the countryside with the families. And, and it's, it's a familiar tradition that is passed down generation to generation. And so uh, a community fandango is essentially a gathering, a party um, where 
families, community members come together and play, sing, dance, son harocho until until it's done. Sometimes it can go until 5 a.m. <laughs> Some, you know, I remember being at one um, Fandango in Veracruz and around 4 a.m. I just had to tap out, you know, oh, I was just like I, they were still going, you know, but I just had to tap out because it's, um, it's a cool, it's, it's, it, there's a word in Spanish, uh, convivencia, which means living and thriving together. There's not really mm. a translation for it in English. And so that essentially is what, what this tradition brings, you know, it's, it's, it's thriving together. And so, mm. you know, sometimes when you're in that, you just keep going. I love that. You know, 4 a.m. may not be my jam, but I love the energy <laughs> that radiates from celebrations and gatherings like that. Yes, yes, definitely. It's a, you know, it's its own experience. And uh, sometimes you just got to tap out when it's, you know, when <laughs> when it's past your time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and what would you say are some of the most important things that you've learned throughout your career studying and making dance? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I've actually been reflecting on this a lot lately and thinking of it not just in terms of my my current career, you know, currently what I do with dance as a, as a director, choreographer, educator, but also thinking back to, you know, being seven and mm. being 10 and, and, you know, kind of the span of what dance has taught me. And one of the first things that comes to mind um, from being younger is, is around discipline and mm you know, the, the discipline of, of, of training. And I feel like this also spans in other art or, or athletic forms. Um, there's a discipline in training, you know, there's a discipline in, in learning a technique and learning a style um, that spans years, sometimes decades, you know. Um, and I think that that often translates to a lot of other facets of life, you know. So I think that's one of the reasons that arts and dance education is so important for youth, because it it can translate to, to other parts of life. Um, and I think the other, the other thing that really comes to mind and it's been, you know, it's one of the more challenging things I've learned is, um, humility, Oh, you know, um, when you are working towards something there, you, you know, even as you're, you're advancing, you're growing in a style or a skill or, developing as a choreographer, you know, whatever it may be as a performer, um, there is this sense of humility that you, you have to have along the way because it's not always going to turn out how you had, had envisioned, but that can't, that can't be what stops you, you know, um, mm. you just gotta, you know, for myself just I've had to kind of accept and, and get past and, and move forward. Um, when, when roadblocks come up in the way. Um, and I think lastly, and I, I think I've referenced this a lot in what we've been saying, I, I've learned just a lot about who I am and where I come from through dance. Um, it's given me a very, very clear tool and lens to understand kind of rhythmically, kind of through movement. That's how I, that's how I think anyway. I think more through movement and rhythm than, <laughs> than through actual words um, to really understand where I come from and begin to begin to, because I feel like this is never fully understood, begin to understand what my place in the world is and in, in the mm. community is. Um, and so that has definitely been kind of a long you know, over three decades kind of process, but I'm, I'm really grateful to, to have dance, to, to introduce, you know, these themes. Yes. Ooh, your place in the community. That's actually something we're going to circle back to a little bit later in the conversation. Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> and right now, like what you just said about humility and growth, what are some things that you struggle with and like, what does it mean to take risks? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm going to think for a second because I have so many, so many answers. I'm just going to try to verbalize <laughs> them. I think just, just a, a little tangent. That's one of my struggles as a dancer. Sometimes I'm like, let me dance it for you, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to verbalize it. Yeah. You know, I think um, if I'm looking at it at a purely kind of logistical playing field, I think mm -hmm. one of the things I struggle with um, is 
kind of the 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 management of the dance world you know mm. the 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 I guess, for lack of a better word, the business side, um, because as, as dancers, you know, in school and in training, we're training in, in movement, we're training in rhythm, we're training in, in music, you know, we're not necessarily training in bookkeeping and, you know, um, all of that kind of stuff. So as I'm no, as my, my company and my work grows, that's definitely been something I've had to adapt to. And I feel like that is that's kind of in in talking with other dancers locally and around the country. That's kind of a common theme of like, okay, now you know we're getting to this place. It's it's not just this place with our movement and our choreography. It's also like we have to to figure out how to match that on the on the business and and logistical side of things. You know, so that's definitely been a, a struggle. I, I don't know that I'd say a struggle, but it's been. It's been a challenge that I've had to learn to overcome over the past few years. And I know that it, it's it's a similar thing, you know, kind of across the board with a lot of other dancers and artists. I'll, I'll say one of the big things, if I'm looking at it from a personal level and, and kind of, you know, who, who I am and my kind of inner ego talking, um, one of the big things I have to overcome is... For lack of a better word, I, I don't really like this term, but I'm just going to use it, is mm. imposter syndrome. Ooh. This idea of like, do I belong here? You know, because just looking at, at where we come from, we're, we're in a culture, a, a culture, a society rooted in white supremacy and, and patriarchy, you know? So being a, a woman of color coming into these spaces, it's sometimes, you know, there's this voice inside of me because we're trained for our whole lives, right? Indirectly or directly. Um, mm mm-hmm to know where we belong and where we don't belong. So as I've gone to attend panels, as I'm applying for grants, as I'm, you know, we're doing these things, there's this voice in my, the back of my head. That's like, do you belong here? You know, is this, is this where you're supposed to be? And it's really, um, it actually takes a lot. And I am getting a little emotional thinking about it. Um, it takes a lot to push past, you know, Mm. it's, it's a little bit scary sometimes. And I think that's kind of where like community support and, and just like ganas, ganas meaning a uh, Spanish slang, like this desire and drive just to, to do it, to make it happen, you know, is, is something I rely on heavily to push past those moments. It doesn't go away either. Like as, as I've continued to grow, it, I think the voice starts to get a little bit louder, um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's just kind of there, especially leaving the, my comfort zone of like, you know, my San Francisco Bay area dance community and, and going into other spaces, um, the voice gets louder. And so it's, it's finding a way to, to overcome it, but to also like cope with why it's there, you know, yes. also find healthy outlets to be like, why is this happening? And, and what can I do to begin to remedy those voices? in the back of my mind. Yes, absolutely. I was definitely going to ask you about that because you recently presented work for Joyce Theater and the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York. These are traditionally white spaces. And I wanted to ask you, what was that process like and how are you as an artist of color navigating and changing these environments? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I have to say that those were both, um, I was contacted by the theaters for both of those. And I, I have to say my first reaction was like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, like, really? Yep. See, me? that's that imposter Us? syndrome. You know, like, mm-hmm. it, and it took me, I remember in getting those emails, it took me a couple of days to be, to even respond. Cause I was just like, is, are, you sh- are you sure? Like, have you seen, like, do you know what I do? Do you know who we are? You know? And so it's it's been interesting, you know. I, I have to say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on on the other end, you know, if if we're kind of reshaping and changing things through the work. But I have to say, on like what the intention I bring is being kind of honest and straightforward in what the mission and intention of the work I do is for you know, not, not watering mm-hmm. that down. Um, yeah. so, you know, even in the, 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 the piece we did for the Lincoln center, that was a concert for kids, you know, that was part of their concerts for kids series. Um, 
And I, I still felt it really important to, to find a way to, to talk about, you know, farm worker and environmental injustice and, you know, the legacy that, that Pachucas had in the 1940s. I felt mm -hmm. really important to find a way to include that in the narrative of the work, because if we don't, then we're not being who we are. Then I'm not being who I am. I'm not bringing the work forward and I'm, I'm watering it down. You know, I'm watering it down for a specific audience. That I think just going back to this idea of kind of imposter syndrome, that's something I also struggle with is, is kind of changing the way, the way we speak, the way I speak in certain situations. And so in, in both approaching the conversations with the Joyce and the Lincoln Center, I, I had to really make a conscious decision of like, okay, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do this as me and as what I do. And I'm not going to try to fit it into another kind of watered down box, you know, so that it doesn't feel, I don't want to say threatening, but in a way it doesn't feel as threatening to, to people who maybe aren't, who aren't used to these concepts or themes. I remember in addition to the Joyce presenting, they virtually screened the show Pachuquismo on their platform, which was the first time our work has been, our work in terms of a a performance, right? A full a full show has been screened to New York audiences. I was really nervous about how it would be received, but had to move forward and just say, we're doing this, we're doing this, and we're, we're putting this out there and whatever happens, happens. In addition to that screening, they also asked me to curate their weekly dance picks. So at the time, I'm not sure if the Joyce is still doing this, um, but they had a, a featured artist choose the their weekly dance picks. So it was, mm -hmm. they would give you a week and say like highlight, you know, four to six dance picks for this week. And we're going to put it on our, on our website and on our social media. And so in that, you know, at first I was trying to like think of things that were like, okay, what would the Joyce theater audience want to see? And, you know, and then, you know, in, in the process of that, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say like, what, First of all, like what the Bay Area dance scene has to offer, because the, I feel like the Bay Area dance scene doesn't get out as much as it needs to. It's not seen from other parts of the country as much as it should be because it's so rich and amazing and beautiful mm -hmm. um, and powerful. And at the same time, like, you know, sharing what my my kind of platforms towards using dance for social change are, you know, and so I was really intentional around the pieces I picked, some of them were talks, some of them were performances, some of them were around you know, the jingle dance, the, the indigenous jingle dance and what that means, you know, to indigenous communities. And so, so I just think in, in working with these communities and theater spaces that I, I haven't really, you know, I'm not totally familiar with my approach after pushing past the, the voices in the head has been to like, do you and do it good. Bringing it back home to the Bay Area, I wanted to talk to you about our community and our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You started this series called Connecting Communities, and some of that work included talking to funders. Now, what mm -hmm. motivated you to move in that direction? Yes. So let's see. Connect. So there's Connecting Communities came out of um, the start of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. and, and trying to find a way for artists, dancers, musicians to stay connected and, and, you know, a lot of that was inspired by, uh, you know, tap jams and, and fandangos where communities gather. And so trying to find a way to continue that connection virtually and connecting communities with funders that came out of a lot of my experiences I've had over the past, you know, at that time, I think this came out in September, 2020. So the prior year in, you know, get beginning to receive national grants and, and beginning to attend these national conferences and being part of these conversations around who who's getting funded, you know, who's getting funded and who who has access to getting funded. And really looking at a lot of my mentors in the Bay Area and beyond who 
are, I mean, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without them who have changed and shaped communities who have, you know, done this work for decades and decades and decades, but because of resources and because of language barriers aren't necessarily able to apply and receive the funding they should be. And so with that, I just felt it really important, you know, in that I don't want to be the only one of the only ones from the Bay Area in in our kind of, you know, dance world of, of dancers of color who are who are coming from dance forms from traditionally black and brown communities, you know, like, I don't want to be one of the only ones getting this. There are so many more people who who need and deserve this this funding. And so mm-hmm. I looked at what I've done and, and, and the relationships I've built with funders and then just felt this kind of community responsibility to share that, you know, like I now have these connections and I need to do what I can to share these connections with other people, you know? Mm-hmm. So that, that's where connecting communities started. Um, it was, it wasn't funded. This was just something I did because I felt like it needed to be done, especially in the time of a pandemic when artists and dancers and youth companies and these organizations are losing money. And when we look at predominantly white organizations or predominantly ballet or modern based organizations and dancers and companies, they have a larger kind of pocket to draw from when, when there's a shift in funding, like, you know, like during a a pandemic and then looking at these, these artists who rely a hundred percent on gig money and performance money and class money. And they're Mm -hmm. just no, it's just done. They're just no longer getting it, you know? So it was Mm -hmm. like, okay, what can I do to, to try to make a connection between the people who have the money and the people who need (laughs) the money, you know? And so I just, it was just an idea I had. And, and, you know, I, I try not to be one of those people who has an idea and sits on it. You know, I was like, all right, I'm I'm doing this and we're, we're just doing it. So just started emailing funders that I had built relationships with, setting up meetings with them, telling them this idea I had, you know, talking not only about um, this need to kind of shift the funding structure, but also the importance of realizing that they're people, funders and, and grantors, they're, they're human mm-hmm. people, right? And, and I think that's part of the, the nature of, of being a little bit afraid to kind of dive into that world is, you know, when you see a website or you see a grant deadline, that's very, it can be very intimidating. But I think seeing the person behind it, seeing the face behind it kind of makes that process a little bit easier, a little less intimidating. And so that was part of the process. Literally just did some cold calls and emails to funders that I had gotten funding from in the past. And then also some I hadn't gotten funding from, you know, just kind of like, this is my idea. This is my vision. And everyone seemed really open to the idea. You know, I was very straightforward in like what what the vision was session one is introducing community members to funders. This is a hundred percent free to artists and dancers in the community. And I made it, you know, I wanted to make it intentionally welcome to dancers rooted in black and brown cultural traditions, you Mm -hmm. know, dancers, artists, musicians, you know, it was kind of around the board, the people who registered, you know, we had seamstresses, musicians, filmmakers who all kind of, wanted this, needed this, you know, needed this kind of introduction to the whole process because it can be very foreign and and very intimidating. Mm -hmm. Um, And so session one was just the introduction. These are the funders. These are their faces. This is what they offer. Session two was tips, you know, tips on how we can make this happen from different perspectives. And it was, it was done in a very casual way. You know, it wasn't done with PowerPoints. It wasn't done with like, you know, (laughs) we have this panel of people sitting at a desk. No, it was like, these are real people. This is what we've gone through. Um, And these are, these are strategies we figured out over the past decade or couple decades or, or, or what have you. Um, And, you know, the final session was really just opening a space for artists to talk directly to funders and say, like, this is what's working for us. This is what isn't working for us. This is our thoughts on what what would make this more accessible for for a lot of us. So it was really great to open up that space. A lot of artists who had never applied for grants attended, which was, you know, the point of it. That was that was 
that was the whole purpose, you know, to make people feel welcome into the process. My idea for this was if I can get one or two people to feel comfortable to begin this process, because it's a process, you know, it's not like mm-hmm. you apply for a grant and you get it. It's a process. You're going to apply and knock at them for many years or, you know, for many months. And then, and then one day you're going to get it. And then that, you know, turns into, to more, you know, we talked about strategies around how to kind of leverage getting one grant to get another and, you know, all of these kinds of things. So I just had this idea, if I can get one or two artists to apply for a grant after this, then that is, (laughs) that, that is the mission, you know? And, and one of the, the tools in doing that was kind of making it feel a little, a little different, you know, we had like in the middle of it, we had a dance break. It's like we would just play music and get up and like, all right, we're all going to dance. So it, 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 it felt more welcoming. It felt more like an artist space than like a, you know, a very official formal panel. Oh man, I didn't, oh. I must've missed that one with yeah. the dance break. <laughs> yeah, we got, it, just, it was just like, all right, let's just dance. Let's, let's, let's get moving. Um, and it was intentional, you know, cause I tried to be like, what would, what would people in the community want in a gathering? Not, not what, what, what is the most effective in teaching people about grants, but what would they want in a gathering, you know, and that, you know, we're not totally about sitting in chairs. We're about music, you know, (laughs) music and, and dancing. So yeah, I really try to kind of make the process feel more accessible and more open and welcome. And I think that's kind of a, a conversation I think that can happen with, with other grantors locally and throughout the country is like, you know, if you want people from different communities and different spaces to apply, how are you making this a space that doesn't say you are welcome here, but that says this is for you? Absolutely. What you're saying is so informative. And to have these events that kind of shift that narrative that grantors and and funders and foundations are these intimidating folks when it's just people behind us. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things too, around this process was like, you can call these people. These are people, if you have questions, you can actually call them and they will, they'll talk to you, which I know for me was very scary and intimidating at first. You know, I I hope to do the, the series again. It was, it's, it's, it's a whole process. And I was grateful for, I think dancers group put in a, a, a contribution into allowing me to get an assistant to help with the registration process. Um, So really grateful for that Um, because it, you know, it's, it, it, I think when I initially had the vision, I was like, I can do all of this. And then like a few (laughs) weeks in, I was like, Oh my God, what did I do? So it, it it made a lot of uh, difference to, to be able to bring on um, someone to support just in the, you know, collecting emails of registrants and whatnot. Yes, absolutely. This series, I hope very much that you continue it. And I hope to see more of these type of gatherings and informal discussions and Mm -hmm. see a shift in the way that folks interact with each other Mm -hmm. and be able to do it in an easier way and not feel so intimidated. We, as somebody who works in a nonprofit and has worked on a few other grant panels, please call, please email. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from the people, like, especially if there's confusion, because if we get your app and we don't have a connection to you, we don't have any kind of prior history, Mm -hmm. you know, it's much easier to say, oh, we had a conversation with them earlier and they talked about this and that a little bit more. They asked questions about this. So now this seems clearer than their initial application. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've made that connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's really important. You know, it's really important. And, you know, even more in that, that process of of personalizing it, you know, so it's not so separate, you know, it's not such a separate entity. Definitely. Absolutely. And I hope to see that shift in a major way, especially after this year. Yes. Yes. Same. I think, you know, I just this morning, I was just scrolling through my Instagram feed as a lot of us do when we wake up um, and just seeing like, I know of just so many people in the community who are running these organizations out of pocket, you know, and Mm -hmm. they're, they're meaningful, impactful organizations. Um, They're people from the community 
creating things for the community. You know, that's so important. And these are the ones that are the most underfunded, either underfunded or completely not funded. They're just straight up running it from their pocket, you know? So that, that shouldn't be the case. That should not be the case. So, you know, I think, um, I agree. It would be great moving forward to have, have that shift, you know, share some of the money that all of these major, major organizations, uh, you know, are getting with, with people in the community who are, they're doing the, they're doing the work daily, you know, be really, it's really important that that starts to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with that, like, what are some of the other shifts that you would like to see in the local, national, global dance communities? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm thinking to formulate my answer because I, I oh, have yeah. a lot of ideas and just want to um, pinpoint some, you know, one thing just that kind of brings together community and national um, national spaces. I, I really want to see more, and this is specifically around dance, but you know, it also spans everything else. I want to see more more Bay area dance companies on the national level. Like I just feel like there's so much in the Bay area, but a lot of it is kind of kept in a bubble, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, And just attending these national conferences and, and, and seeing, you know, artists getting these national grants, like there's so much here. There's so much here that doesn't, doesn't get out. It doesn't leave and it should, you know, so that is definitely one of the shifts I want to see happen. Um, I think that, you know, when we look at, at kind of the landscape of the, the New York dance scene or the East coast dance scene, or even the LA dance scene, there are a ton of dance booking agents and there really aren't any dance booking agents here, you know? So, so how can we shift that? How can we start to look at how, dance companies here can be connected with theaters, you know, around the country and then begin to travel and show their work and show what, what the, the powerful Bay area dance and uh, dance scene has. Another thing I I really, really want to see is um, I think we need to, to, these, these conversations happen, but I think they need to happen a little more intentionally and they need to continue is, is to really talk about white supremacy in the dance scene in the Bay area. Mm -hmm. I think because the Bay Area is seen as such a like liberal, you know, liberal community and, and people are open and, and all of this, I feel like we can still do more. I feel like there's a lot more that can still be done. And this is kind of in the funder sense. This is also, I think, kind of in the performance sense and, and just looking at like who who is in what spaces, you mm-hmm. know? I feel like there's a lot of um, compartmentalizing that is done around dance forms here. You know, there's a lot of like, okay, these dance forms are performed in this kind of festival. And then these dance forms can be on these big giant dance stages that have these giant audiences, you know, um, which, which also reflects like artist fees, you know, um, mm-hmm. opportunity. And I just, I, I think that we, we, we really have to shift that. That does not need to be the case, you know, a cultural traditional dance form that has, you know, existed and survived for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years does not need to be compartmentalized into two dance festivals a year. You know, why Mm -hmm. aren't they getting put on these big giant stages that, that often feature, you know, they often present dancers from out of town or companies from out of town and don't really focus on what's happening locally. Um, I think that's a major shift that should happen. And I think it should happen soon. You know, I think, it's been a really long time coming that, that these kind of little boxes that, that forms and traditions are put into, um, they need to break out of them. You know, it's, it's, it is definitely time for that to happen. Absolutely. That sense of gatekeeping Mm -hmm. is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm, witnessing a change and a shift in that right now in some of the larger institutions but i agree with you it needs to happen faster Mm -hmm. quicker yesterday yeah (laughs) yes definitely 
definitely. I think these these artists and these forms they they just. Des- I mean, it's not they. It's not even about deserving it. It's just like they need to be there. You know, they mm-hmm. need to. And that's definitely an opportunity for changing growth in the dance community. I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important, and I think you know, also just looking across like the national landscape of like you know. There's, there's almost this sense of like, okay, it's Latino Heritage Month. We had our one, you know, Mexican dance company. It's Black <laughs> History it's Black History Month. We had our one, you know, African dance company. It's like, no, like why, why aren't, that needs to be presented year round. Like that's, you know, we don't need to fit into that, this, this little box, you know, that's. Um, Absolutely. Those, those platforms and those performances deserve more than a, a, a month you know, more than a month. And so it's almost, I feel like in some spaces it's almost become like a, like a check, like a box that you check. You're like, done. We got our, our one, you know, our one Asian dance company in Asian, you know, our one Filipino dance company and and our Mm -hmm. one black dance company, our one Latino dance company. And now we can, you know, move on and do quote unquote, the real dance companies. Like, no, that's not how that works. That is, that's, that's wrong. That's, that's not how it works at all. So think that definitely needs to be shifted and and we need to 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 look at how we can kind of move forward as you know collaboratively you know what what how we can all move forward not just you know one or two but everyone in in this space everyone in these traditions everyone in these communities that is so accurate and especially in this last year during the pandemic, I've definitely seen an overhaul of moving and shifting to that effect. And also people calling it out for what it Mm -hmm. is and not, you know, just letting it slide anymore. Yes. Yes. There have been so many articles of people calling out institutions, people calling out specific leadership saying, hey, you know, exactly what you just said. There needs to be, Latinx performances all year long. There needs to be Indian performances all all year long. Like there shouldn't be a special evening and like, okay, thank you for your time. Yes. <laughs> like how Definitely. does that work? <laughs> think during this pandemic people have had really a time to sit and think and reflect and take action in a way to make change going forward Mm -hmm. how has this time kind of impacted you like any observations or surprises during this time yeah you know this time um it's definitely been it's definitely been difficult um for me in that the dance forms that i train in, you know, cause I, I consider myself, I'm, I am a student for the rest of my life. Um, yes. the dance, you know, whether I'm performing it or teaching it, I'm, I'm a student forever. So I, I like to say the dance, the dance traditions I train in and, and, and do, they're all rooted in community. They're all rooted in gatherings, right? They're all rooted in, in, in being connected with other people, with the music, you know, having live, mu- live music is a huge element, all of this. And so it's been a real struggle to not be around that for a year you know that's been really hard it's shifted it's it's been extremely difficult you know I I have to say I feel like there's I've been a little more push for innovation you know a little more push for innovation suddenly learned how to be like a film editor you know (laughs) like we had to develop all these new skills to continue um making the work that we make. And I also feel like it's been a bit of an opportunity to connect with other people in communities that I wouldn't necessarily be able to connect with if, if it weren't for kind of this new virtual landscape we've gone into. I think connecting communities with funders has been a real example of that, you know, kind of opening up access for people who maybe wouldn't have it um, in other spaces. I also, you know, one one really surprising thing for me that has come out of this is being introduced to audiences across the country, you know, yes. that I wouldn't necessarily have been able to, you know, 
connect with. And that has led to a lot of other connections that has been interesting and surprising, you know, at the same time. And I hope that other artists are experiencing a similar thing, you know, and in that their, their work is now being shown in, you know, on the East coast or even in different countries. Um, and then, you know, that that's getting your, 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 your work out there, you know, it's getting your work out there for other audiences, for other theaters, for other communities. And, and, you know, one, it, it impacts in a different way, you know, those voices and narratives when it necessarily come from someone who's over there. So I feel like it's really important to sh- that these voices, stories, um, experiences are being shared wider range, but also what that could mean is it's now people in New York know about your work. Now people in Italy know about your work. So what can that, what does that mean in the future? I think that those are some surprising and interesting connections that have been made during the past, what is it now, year and two months? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And you know, speaking of new audiences, what's next? You said earlier that you're going on tour next year. After receiving the New England Foundation for the Arts grants, we were supposed to begin touring in 2020. So our, we were supposed to, you know, kind of start leaving our our lovely, beautiful Bay Area bubble and start to go to other places um, <laughs> with the work. All of that, you know, obviously was postponed or canceled due to the pandemic. Um, so now as as things begin to shift And things begin to reopen, theaters begin to reopen and whatnot. We are now planning some tour dates. We have some tour dates planned for 2022 around the country. And um, I'm also in the process of developing a new show. So I was very, very fortunate and I'm super grateful to have received the Hewlett 50 Arts Commission grant in collaboration with Brava Theater to develop a new work. So currently diving into a summer of research and development for the new work. The new work is called Ghostly Labor, and it is a tap dance, son harocho, and Afro-Caribbean rhythmic show that explores the history of female labor in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. So both looking at kind of the exploitation, the legacies of exploitation and profiteering on female labor, but also really looking at the, the resilience and strength and real people who have, you know, been doing this work for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and continue to. So a lot of the work is rooted in um, field work and live interviews. So that's part of why it was postponed is the, the you know, people feeling safe, you know, to meet and and have these interviews and and really connect. And so that's something I'll be diving into this summer. And then, you know, simultaneously as Pachuquismo is touring, we'll be creating and developing the work. And then it will premiere in 2023 at Brava Theater. So I'm really, really excited about this work. I'm also really excited to really intentionally bring together tap dance and son harocho with Afro-Cuban rhythms. You know, that is, Mm -hmm. these are all forms I've trained in and studied in. And now to really be intentional around how we can bring those together is is something I'm really excited about. And I'm also really excited about connecting with with communities around the Bay Area, you know, in, in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas to really meet with people and share their experiences, you know, share whatever their story is that they want to tell. I'm excited to witness ghostly labor as it develops and once we start seeing it on stages and whichever ways you present it. You're such a fabulous storyteller. Thank you so much for joining us, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me, Andrea. Thanks so much for joining us for this audio experience. For additional content that reflects our dynamic dance community, visit our In Dance article archive at dancersgroup.org.